Now, the human brain is possessed of an interesting attribute, which you might call um, adaptive preference formation. An adaptive preference formation means that if you're forced to choose between B and A, and there isn't that much to choose between them, in other words, it's a trade-off, right? Your brain will decide to like B's strengths more than A's. So hello, Rory. How's it going? Very well indeed. Yeah. Um, well, as well as can be expected, because um, fortunately, I work with a team of 15 people. I'm now, obviously, we're all home uh, isolated at the moment. Where are you all, in fact? Uh, we might as well all ask. I'm in Kent, uh, just outside the M25, so just outside London. Uh, I'm in Madrid, actually. Been in lockdown for like 12, 12 days now. 12 days, yeah. It's uh, And it's very, very strict in Spain, isn't it? So essentially, you're not even allowed to drive unless you're on your own doing some essential journey. And so the, the, it, it's unbelievably uh, restrictive. Yeah, super restrictive. You, you're not even allowed to like go outside and jog. You're only allowed to walk your dog or, or go get some groceries or the pharmacy. That's it. That's it. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. My goodness. I'm, I'm, interested, I'm interested to know what initially got you interested in marketing and how did you eventually go on to become Ogilvy's vice chairman? That's a long and, as I think is always the case, slightly convoluted story. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, when I finished uh, my last year Madrid, at actually, university, I did classics. For like 12, and if you've done classics, now. Latin and Greek, for people who don't know the British argot, yeah, um, uh, the assumption is you're going to become a school teacher. And Sure enough, I investigated becoming a school teacher, and for a fourth year, I did a teacher training qualification. And about halfway through, I had a kind of panic attack. It was a form of sort of uh, a kind of lateral form of claustrophobia, where I realized that if I went straight into teaching, my entire life would be spent school, university, school. And I thought, okay, I can't really do this. This is crazy. And um, I also realized that at the age of 23, I wasn't really cut out for being a school teacher mm -hmm. on the grounds that I tended to side with the mischievous pupils <laughs> rather than the teachers. So the, the whole business of imposing discipline for minor offenses, you know, sort of, you know, breaching a dress code or something, uh, was just something I couldn't get my head around. I had no appetite for doing that kind of thing at all. I tended to side with the miscreants. And so I'd always had a vague interest in advertising. And so um, early in the year, I started, once I had that attack of, of panic, I started applying to various advertising agencies. Um, I got first interviews, let me see it. I think I had first interviews at J. Walter Thompson, Publicis, Ogilvy and Mather Direct, and there was a four, Saatchi's. And I had second interviews at Ogilvy and Mather Direct and J. Walter Thompson. And I got a job at Ogilvy and Mather Direct, which, funnily enough, um, at the time, direct marketing was very much the poor relation of advertising. But in many ways, particularly at O&M Direct at the time, which was the home to some extraordinarily interesting people in the creative department, in the planning department, in account handling. You had Drayton Bird, who is the kind of doyen of British direct marketing, was the chairman and executive creative director. Um, the number of staff who either worked there long term or passed through was fascinating. And um, it was also a time where d people from advertising were starting to work in direct marketing, particularly freelancers. Mm -hmm. And so there was an interesting kind of cultural clash, which I think was, like all culture clashes, rather beneficial, in fact, because mm -hmm. we all learned quite a lot from each other. And so I started there. David Ogilvy always said, in fact, that any copywriter should spend three or four years working in direct marketing first so that you develop an instinct for what works. And um, I think that was still and still is very good advice. And so anyway, I kind of flunked it as an account man and very briefly became a planner before moving to the creative department mm -hmm. as a copywriter. I joined in September 88. I ended up becoming a copywriter, I suppose, in, I think, if I've got this right, June 1989. Wow. Um, 
so no june 90 june 1990 i'm so sorry i was a planner for a time uh obviously um and then finally became a copywriter in june 90 and then through being partnered with various very good art directors i think i learned fast uh through uh, the people i work with uh ended up as head of copy i suppose in the uh late 90 or mid 90s and uh, creative director of course the growth of direct marketing was so fast and the the uh, this was an age where you could get promoted very very fast indeed um i ended up creative director and then eventually vice chairman uh in uh, of the whole group uh and i suppose that must have been in about 2004 2005 hmm. well that's great congrats and how's this unique hiring process that you guys have in ogilvy well, I, I mean, it's interesting. I'm, I don't know if we do have a unique process. Certainly the behavioral science practice has an interesting process where mm -hmm. we hold a summer school for recent graduates, typically people who've done a um, behavioral science degree of some shape or form, although oh. we'd equally be open to evolutionary psychologists, psychology degrees, um, anything of that kind. And um, we have a summer school and tend to recruit from that, sometimes immediately, sometimes in a deferred way. Mm -hmm. So obviously we can't take five people simultaneously, but if we like four or five of the people, in many cases, I like almost all the people, in fact, on the summer school, uh, we kind of keep them in a holding pattern and hope to contact them later with a, with a job offer if we grow sufficiently. And so that's a very interesting way of hiring. It does have a disadvantage, which worries me a little, in mm -hmm. that because it lasts a week, it probably favours those people who can either live in London or stay with friends in London. So I am conscious of the fact that it may be a little unfair to um, uh, people who are, uh, you know, um, from further afield. Equally, I suppose, by the time you've finished your graduate um, course, you probably have a college mate somewhere in or near London whom you mm -hmm. can crash with for a week. But other than that, it always strikes me as a very strong uh, way of choosing. Uh, not all that dissimilar to the J. Walter Thompson second interview I went on, which was also a two-day residential course uh, at a place called Minster Lovell. And they clearly decided that for graduate recruitment, having some sort of time away was necessary. That, may, you know, more than just a simple interview and a day with exercises mm. uh, might be necessary. But I, I'm, always, I'm also very nervous about hiring because it occurs to me that we're ridiculously overweighting the importance of academic achievement mm. in the people we hire. And it strikes me as an example of a more common pattern, which is the need to make people compete and the need to make comparisons forces us to apply the same criteria to everybody, which mm. means that we massively over-index on those people who happen to meet what are fairly arbitrary uh, criteria for employment. I mean, there isn't much evidence that shows that your performance in academia correlates brilliantly with your performance in the workplace. It was always said amusingly in medicine that doctors who got, I think, was it... Um, uh, doctors who got firsts made the, the best academics. Doctors who got seconds made the best doctors. And doctors who, thir who got thirds became the richest doctors. <laughs> and that might be because if you've got a third, you tend to go into fields of medicine which are low prestige, but as a result, high salary, like mm. plastic surgery or something. <laughs> and um, uh, in the same way, it worries me. I've always said, look, if you get a CV from someone who's got fairly mixed academic um, credentials, but has been, you know, London, un you know, I don't know, Britain under 23 backgammon champion or something weird like that, you mm -hmm. should always interview those people. Because you might say that anybody who's got a remarkable talent for something uh, is worth interviewing. And the further thing I'd say, of course, is that the mix of skills required by a workplace, by a company, um, because capitalism is generally very good at employing people in complementary ways, that the mix of, of talents that companies require is much, much broader than the mix of talents that shows uh, academic preeminence. Hmm. I mean, yeah. there are certain people, I mean, we shouldn't, you know, a, a lot of people who've got great academic qualifications will be horrified by me saying this. 
But there's a very, very valuable talent in business for people who are simply motherfucking charming. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we know, I mean, we, you know, uh, and our academics would say that's horrible. You should only pay people on their proven ability in their mm -hmm. field. But people who are just remarkably charming and likable have an extraordinary potent effect on businesses, A, on the people who work with them, but also if you're with clients, it just leads to a general sort of uh, pattern of, uh, of, of um, it, it, those people can change the mood in a meeting. Mm -hmm. in a way that, of course, is often instrumental in whether something happens or whether it doesn't. So, I mean, we've got to be very, we've got to be very careful about this, this idea that by making hiring meritocratic, we're actually making it monotonous. Hmm. So how would you suggest we go about solving this? I don't know if you could call it an issue or this... Uh, problem that we're hiring the same types of people i mean one thing i always said is that since um since you know uh if now this strategy doesn't work if everybody does it but if everybody else is doing two one and above mm -hmm. we should actively advertise for people with two twos because the best 10 percent of people with lower seconds are going to be probably better in the workplace Mm -hmm. if you apply different criteria to their selection, than the median person who's got a 2-1. And Unless you assume that somehow... Uh, now, obviously, there are areas. Medicine will be one. Law might be another. Uh, mathematics would patently be a third. Where if you want someone who's a fantastically good mathematician, by and large, mm -hmm. uh, university selects for those people fairly well. Uh, if you want someone who's a creative person in an advertising agency, I don't think university selects for it at all, really. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, it, it, you know, it's it, it's a very interesting question because, I, I mean, I remember uh, working with an HR director who worked for Mobile, um, and they had a two-day graduate selection away day. And one of the rules was, now you, you, you can't even believe this, but if anybody had... If anybody drank anything from their mini bar, you couldn't hire them. Mm. Now, bear in mind, this is about 1989, 89, no, 1990. Mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. So you stayed in a hotel. You, you went through a whole series of selection exercises. And one of the incremental rules of which the graduate recruits were unaware was that if you had anything from the mini bar, they couldn't hire you. What? <laughs> now, that strikes me. Now, the, the HR director said, well, someone who empties the minibar is quite interesting because what it suggests is it's kind of party at my room this evening. <laughs> and those people have disproportionately high social skills. OK. Um, now, the interesting thing was that, in fairness, if you're recruiting for someone who's working in Mobile's finance department, where you're probably dealing with billion dollars, you know, or you know, billions of dollars, actually having someone who's a bit, a bit you know, it probably isn't a good idea. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're hiring for someone in marketing, to be honest, you want the guy who raids the minibar. Mm. And so it's a complicated thing. So what I'm saying is that attributes that are a disadvantage in certain fields are a positive advantage in others. And so the idea that we deploy identical criteria like two, one, and above in deciding who to interview strikes me as fundamentally erroneous. Hmm. You know, there will be subjects like mathematics where, yeah. yes, you know, someone, um, particularly I think because mathematics to a large extent is, is an area of kind of innate ability. Mm. Um, also, um, in that I'm not, I, my brother's a mathematician. A lot of my friends at university were mathematicians. And bluntly speaking, there were people who could work as hard as they liked, and they were never going to get a first. Mm. And there were also people who, okay, they weren't they weren't guaranteed to get a first, but if they basically put in four hours a day, you know, they they, they were going to coast it. I mean, I had one friend who's a extraordinarily talented mathematician from working class fa family. None of his family had been to university before, but mm -hmm. in the middle of the Cambridge Maths tripos, he used to have a couple of pints at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. Now, bear in mind, it's a three-hour exam in the morning, three-hour exam in the afternoon over two consecutive days. And on both days, he'd come back in the middle of the exams and he'd down a pint or two. <laughs> and even the other even the other talented mathematicians were aghast at this. He just said, no, helps me relax. <laughs> okay. 
No, he, you know, he patently had a level of innate talent, which was just, you know, kind of completely off the scale. He did have an interesting family heritage. Uh, mm. One of his grandparents had been one of the last hangmen. Uh, in <laughs> so he, he did have a very interesting family background, but he well. clearly had spectacular innate talent. Uh, and so in something like maths, you know, I think the predictive value is fairly high. There are other subjects where, to be honest, the predictive value is very poor. I mm. met a friend who, you know, a very nice person um, uh, who had been members, uh, who'd run the university's Afro-Caribbean Society for a year. Now, she said to me, I made a terrible mistake because I was doing this, running the society while studying medicine. And she said, mm -hmm. I learned too late that if you're studying history, you can run a society. If you're studying medicine, you can't mm -hmm. because medicine is unbelievably grueling. And I went, yeah, no, I buy that. I, my best friend was a medic who was always much, much busier than everybody else. Yeah, no, that made perfect sense to me. She got a third. Um, uh, in my view, there was nothing uh, about that third that would make her uh, less appealing in terms of recruitment than, uh, you know, an equivalent person with a first silly to make that decision and i'm really interested in this uh, sort of perspective that you bring that the opposite of a logical solution if if there was a logical solution we would have already found it yeah uh, and that that's a really important point which is that there are undoubtedly there are there is an area of inquiry of human inquiry where it is possible to arrive maybe with or without computation, with or without computers, mm. but it's nonetheless possible to arrive at a definitive single right answer. Mm -hmm. Those areas of human inquiry are, are actually, they tend to be called things like physics and chemistry and, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and arguably mathematics, okay? Now, there are huge areas of human inquiry where no such thing is possible. Um, in, you know, in determining how to encourage people in the midst of the coronavirus to wash their hands, there are multiple right answers as to what might be the best answer. No one will ever be provably optimal. I think there are ideas you could test uh, which which would be highly likely to succeed, but I'd say no more than that. I mean, you know, I've been in this game for 30 years and I know enough about from direct marketing to know that not everything you think works, works. Mm -hmm. What I also know, however, and this is why we have to keep testing, is some things which you think wouldn't work or alternatively you think are too trivial to have a large effect end up having an enormous effect. Mm -hmm. And so simply because something seems slightly trivial or oblique or counterintuitive is not a reason not to test it. And so um, uh, my argument there is, is simply that... Um, uh, if you you know if lots and lots of logical people have looked at a problem and the problem still persists the likely explanation is it's not their kind of problem hmm. it's a problem where you have to intervene obliquely it's a problem where the solution is counterintuitive and therefore to logical people seems illogical hmm. for example or it's a solution where the 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 real solution to it is simply too trivial um, for that, for it to be considered worthy of those logical people's attention, that that's perfectly plausible, or that they framed the problem in completely the wrong terms. So they framed the problem in terms of solving some predefined measurable metric, and the confine the, the the mental constraint of highly logical people in being forced only to use those variables, and. Um, metrics which are numerically expressible, for example, mm -hmm. is an obstacle to solving the problem. Do you think that this is harming creativity? Um, uh, yes. Uh, and the reason it harms creativity is very simple. It's that um, logical people get given far more problems to solve than creative people do. Mm -hmm. This is why I founded the behavioral science practice. I didn't want to be confined to solving advertising communications problems. Mm -hmm. I thought that creativity is too valuable to be painted into a corner in that way. And um, what I love is the fact that you can go and say, you know, okay, I'm sure that economists and lawyers and highly rational people of that persuasion have already looked at this problem and uh, the answer will not be found uh, within any of their mental models. Mm 
And that's why the problem persists. Now, the reason it's creatively, um, economics is creatively limiting in itself because it refuses permission for you to use psychological solutions to mm -hmm. uh, behavioral problems. Everything has to be an incentive or a, you know, an edict or a punishment or something. Uh, you know, everything, you know, incentives are very important. I'm not, I'm not saying that economics is completely deranged. Incentives have an effect. I'm not suggesting that, you know, that drink driving legislation has had no effect on people's propensity to drink drive. Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I wouldn't be, I, you know, but equally, um, I'm not allowed to discount the importance of their ideas, but they're allowed to discount the relevance of mine. Mm -hmm. And it's the asymmetry that leads to uh, the... Um, what I call a, a huge creative opportunity cost, which is that in any organization, creative ideas have to have received the approval and the imprimatur of rational people. You know, if you come up with a creative idea, a bunch of rational people will be given the job of doing a cost benefit analysis and a feasibility mm -hmm. study and so forth. That's fine, by the way. I'm not necessarily disputing that. The problem is it never happens the other way around. Rational people never have to present their workings out or their assumptions to more creative people. And so problems that are given to rational people first never escape their purview. Hmm. And, and can you give me one example of what you can achieve by using psychology and business, what you call the psychological moonshots? Yeah, there's a little one which I haven't been able to test. Um, Uh, which is uh, train overcrowding, okay? Now, the assumption of train overcrowding uh, is that uh, the definition of train overcrowding is a numerical one. It's not a psychological one, it's a numerical one. It's anybody who's forced to stand on a train. Mm -hmm. Now, you might make it more sophisticated by multiplying that by the duration of their stand, which would seem not altogether unreasonable because standing between two tube stops is a big difference between st and standing between 20, mm -hmm. you know, okay. But nonetheless, that's a numerically defined um, definition. And I would say that um, you, you might want to uh, look at it differently and say uh, the measure you really want is annoyance. The first measure you want is how upset people are with mm -hmm. overcrowding. And the truth of the matter is that the people who are very frequent travelers are probably much more upset than the people who are infrequent travelers. So a, a standard numerical measure would assume that the thing is commutative and it would assume that a hundred people who have to stand 10% of the time contribute as much to train overcrowding as 10 people who have to stand 100% of the time. And according to that definition, the objective definition of overcrowding, that is absolutely true. Psychologically, I'd say there's a very, very big difference between those two, that actually 100 people who have to stand 10% of the time simply file that in the shit happens tray and aren't that unhappy with their commuter train service, whereas 10 people who have to stand every day are bordering on the livid. Mm -hmm. Now, I simply said in the most crowded parts of the route, if you ran three or four trains a day, Uh, peak hours in both directions, you might need to run four in the morning and only two in the afternoon, whatever, okay? But if you ran trains that were more expensive, unless you had a season ticket, So in other words, they were trains that ran more or less exclusively for first-class passengers or season ticket holders. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, you would solve the, a, a very large part of the psychological problem. Because those people who are most frequent travelers would have the problem solved most. Hmm. Now, what's interesting is a thing we call lateral category analysis. Because if you think about it, lateral category analysis is based a bit, a bit like the idea in TRIZ, that Russian problem solving, Soviet era Russian problem solving thing. Um, most problems have already been solved. They've just been solved in a different domain to the one in which you're contemplating it. If you look at air travel, airlines have already worked that out. Because if you flew to Frankfurt 20 times a year, after your 10th flight or your 13th flight or your 15th flight, you'd get upgraded to the BA silver level. Mm -hmm. And then after another 20 or 30 flights, you get upgraded to the BA gold level. Now, once you've got a BA silver card, Although you'd still be sitting in an economy seat, your check-in, your luggage check-in, your security, your lounge, and your boarding experience would be that of a, first, uh, of a business class passenger. 
And so if you went to a restaurant every week, you would expect to be given a better table. Yeah. I'm simply arguing that if you make the journey on that train uh, 250, well, what would it be, 300, 400 times a year, you should expect a better seat. Yeah. It's very simple human psychology. Restaurateurs have cracked it. Airlines have cracked it. Trains haven't. And then there's a second level of psychological investigation, which is to ask, why don't people like standing anyway? And if you go one deeper, the argument might be because if you don't get a seat, you get nothing. The brain is possessed of an interesting attribute, which you might call um, adaptive preference formation. An adaptive preference formation means that if you're forced to choose between B and A, and there isn't that much to choose between them, in other words, it's a trade-off, right? Your brain will decide to like B's strengths more than A's, mm -hmm. okay? And so if you design trains so that the seats were in the middle and didn't have a view out of the window and didn't have a table, but people standing had a bum rest of you out of the window, two USB chargers, a hook to hang their bag, and a little table on which to put their laptop, or even a shelf along the window of the train on which they could balance a laptop fairly safely, a lot of people would choose to stand. The reason people hate being made to stand is because people who sit get everything, people who stand get fuck all. Mm. And so there is no way of using adaptive preference formation to rewrite your preferences retrospectively so that you're glad you're standing up. Well, it's okay. So, so if you redesign things so that there's a trade off, you create more aggregate happiness than you do if it's all or nothing. Hmm. That's, basically what what do you call hacking the subconscious right it's hacking the subconscious completely up but that's fine because the only purpose of presumably uh, unless it's safety okay the only purpose of reducing overcrowding on trains is to reduce human misery and annoyance mm -hmm. you know it is it is a problem with a psychological objective which has been given to engineers yeah and, and engineering solutions are insanely expensive. They require longer trains, faster trains, more frequent trains, or they create annoyance because you force too many fucking seats into a train carriage in order, you know, so that nobody has any leg room and that everybody everybody is sitting there hunched up like a bloody, you know, like a cripple with, with a, you know, worse still, with a seat which is like an ironing board. <laughs> you know, it's it's not a good idea. Why do you think that psychology has been disregarded in business for so long? Um, because, A, because, of course, business likes the pretense of certainty that models deliver. Because you, um, secondly, business is slow to pick up on the importance of testing. It's only in the last sort of, you know, if you think about it, testing in marketing was confined to direct marketing, which was a niche discipline 25 years ago. And so business is probably, you know, remarkably, uh, and there, there's a lot of testing that goes on in markets. You know, markets are an example of different people's ideas, but testing within a business uh, is slow to take off. And, I, and so I think you do need to test fairly robustly in order to practice this stuff. The job of behavioral science isn't to be right. It's to tell you what to test. Um, uh, and also then to put findings from testing into a kind of recognizable mental framework which can inform future tests. Drayton Bird, that uh, creative director and chairman I mentioned, he said, you don't do direct marketing to make money. First and foremost, you do it to learn. Hmm. To, to learn about human psychology. Uh, because actually, by the way, I mean, nearly everybody's assumptions, even about successful businesses, turn out to be kind of wrong. Um, you know, people will make very narrow assumptions about who their core target audience is, and it turns out, you know, okay, you know, if you think about it, you're, you're, you're a sneaker company. What's one of the biggest markets for sneakers in the world? I mean, you know, Nike and Adidas, et cetera. Actually, it's old people because they have foot problems. You know, um, uh, you know, if you think about it, you know, 30 year old women will often wear, you know, fashionable shoes uh, in public. Uh, 65 year old women possibly can't. 
And so, you know, it's very, very dangerous to allow your own preconceptions to go untested. And since you're saying that um, marketing is basically a study of human psychology, what, what have you learned about human behavior in uh, your 30 years as a marketer? Um, I mean, I could go on for hours about this. Uh, a simple thing is to go back to what I said earlier. Small things can have very large effects because we perceive the world through inference. We don't have an objective take on the world. And what affects behavior is what something means and what something means is context dependent. Um, I, I'd probably say also that attempts, much as people talk about, you know, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, attempts to segment people um, by personality type are not entirely um, uh, without merit, but it's much, much less valuable than people think. What do you mean by that? Uh, the the idea that you know the idea that you can create lots and lots of sort of psychographic uh, groups and enjoy spectacular uh, increases in your targeting uh, through uh, profiling personality uh, that is not um, it can happen and it can be quite useful but it is not the game changer uh, that data obsessives think it is. Uh, you know, in many cases, other variables will be far, far more important. I'm talking about those other other variables. How does evolutionary psychology play a role? Uh, I mean, evolutionary psychology is hugely important because it tells us why um, we perceive the world we the way we do and why we don't perceive it objectively. And there's a great book by someone called Don Hoffman called The Case Against Reality, where he makes the very simple point that in every single model, evolution prefers fitness over accuracy. And so it's not in our evolutionary interest to perceive the world objectively. Um, I would argue that uh, Robert Trivers takes this one stage further and says it's not even in our evolutionary interest to have an accurate take on our own motivations. That large parts of our um, uh, our mental makeup and our motivations are opaque to introspection, and that we are strangers to ourselves, which has important implications for market research. How literally you take market research uh, has to be questioned once you understand about a, a bit about evolutionary psychology. It also helps you realize, of course, uh, what people are really trying to do, as distinct from what they say they're trying to do that in many cases the reason a product may be successful or indeed the reasons a product may fail may have very little to do with the particular attributes of that product uh, in its category. And so, you know, for example, uh, I, I'll give you a very simple example of an application of evolutionary psychology, which is in a government meeting on how you get younger people to save for pensions. And by the way, I didn't despair. I thought there were behavioral science um, uh, solutions which would encourage young people to save more, not least if you made the pension money retrievable in an emergency. OK, uh, you know, um, but I also said that at some level, you must understand that uh, a large percentage of people in their 20s are highly um, geared towards finding an attractive person of the opposite sex with whom to copulate, uh, although they, they don't think of it like that, okay? And therefore, we shouldn't be altogether surprised that the in even you know it, it, it put it this way it would not be a shock finding in evolutionary psychology which is that the urge to save for posterity comes later in life and may of course be heavily triggered by something like having children now i'm not saying that's true by the way i'm simply saying that as, as i said the point about all this stuff is it doesn't tell you what to say it tells you where to look and well, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't confidently say it's a waste of time selling pensions to twenty-five-year-olds. Um, I think that behavioural science could reduce some of the friction of younger people getting pensions. But at the same time, if we look at it and say that um, uh, you know uh, pension saving is still proportionately lower in twenty-five-year-olds when correcting for other variables than it is for forty-five-year-olds. Okay, that should not necessarily be evidence that we failed. 
It may simply be a tougher challenge because of, well, I mean, hormonal factors. Hormones affect behavior. They're part of the context that affect how we react to things. You know, and so, um, you know, that's why you don't get many 73-year-olds kind of going wakeboarding, you know, in the same way, because their attitude to physical risk and bravado has changed. Of course. And I'm interested, very interested about this uh, hacking the subconscious and self-placebos. How, not, now that we know that we're strangers to ourselves, how can we use that to like, can we use self-placebos to basically grow as human beings or to achieve our goals, trick our subconscious into achieving something, basically. If you look at the world economy, uh, when it started to get rich, and that was kind of the, I guess, the UK and the Netherlands and Belgium were the first three countries to sort of really industrialize. Um, what you see is that the two or three huge industries which appear first, um, are all completely unnecessary. Tea, coffee, tobacco, okay? They're all mood-changing substances. Um, opium, I suppose. I'm, as a Brit, I probably ought to confess that one as well. Okay, <laughs> that's that's a fairly dramatic uh, version. Um, and um, uh, what I would argue is that most subsequent forms of extravagance, like the, you know, enormous industries like the fashion industry, which is several trillion dollars a year, women's fashion, beauty, and makeup. Okay, something like three to four trillion dollars a year. It's more than the world spends on um, uh, education. Wow. That is principally a placebo market, by which I mean that high fashion is a mood-altering substance. What do you mean by uh, that? that the principal reason that people um, uh, go and buy uh, and men to a lesser extent, probably. Um, uh, th I think the difference with men is you can opt out of clothing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can patently opt out of cosmetics. Uh, it's very easy to get my daughters to self isolate. You just don't let them wear any makeup. and They won't leave the house anyway. OK, I'm mean, seriously, I confiscated their bloody foundation, if that's what it's called. I'm not an expert. OK, they, they, they couldn't leave the house. They'd find it impossible because someone might see them. Um, but those industries principally exist because they're mood altering. The vast majority of clothing sold in the world outside the very poorest parts of the world is not sold to protect your body from the elements to keep you warm. OK, now, OK, we say it is. We say we bought a Canada goose. Gilet, okay. I'm getting quite good here. Foundation, gilet, Re really rocking my feminine side here. Um, uh, the uh, but we say we bought a Canada Goose gilet because of its fantastic um, insulation properties, but that's bullshit, really. Okay, there are loads and loads of other things which would probably do the job nearly as well, and we bought it because it had a Canada Goose logo on the front, and that changed the way we felt when we went out in public. By the way, paracetamol has the same effect as fashion, uh, which is it reduces social anxiety. Uh, not, not widely known. Maybe I shouldn't share it because people might abuse it that way. But apparently paracetamol has an effect not only on kind of reduction of inflammation and pain, but it also reduces social anxiety. Wow. Well, sorry, I've got to just answer a very quick offstage question. Um, and um, so when, when we talk about mood altering substances, you know, whether it's Red Bull, that there's a very strong placebo element to everything we do, that we judge it on how it will enhance our mood. Hmm. And um, uh, as a result, you know, there is the thing which is its medicinal value, you know, and undoubtedly, you know, there's some level of, you know, I'm not, not disputing for a second that Canada Goose gear is very, very good at insulating from the elements. Why you need that in Britain is an interesting question. You know, or, or Italy, actually, in Spain. That people wear Canada Goose in Spain in January, do they? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, come on, right? Okay. <laughs> you know, this is not, you know, in Spain, it's high. I, I know the Spanish feel the cold more than we do. I notice that whenever I go to Spain and Italy, on what I think of as a bit of a sunny day, you see people going around dressed in kind of Arctic gear. <laughs> but, I mean, a large part of that is, it, you know, is nothing to do with the principal function of the thing. And so... It'd also be possible to create a nocebo effect, you know, 
um, where something that was actually very, very good was devalued. Well, I would argue a very big nocebo, as distinct from Canada Goose, is the anorak. Now, you know, anorak is a term of opprobrium. It's a term of abuse for nerdy people, which is precisely because they wear practical but unfashionable clothing. In other words, they lack the necessary social nuance to understand that although an anorak does an extremely good job of keeping you warm outdoors, it's not a great way to pull or to look cool or to signal your unbelievable sensitivity to the world of uh, haute couture. And so an anorak is an item of clothing whose function, whose core function, its functional attributes, it performs very, very well, but its placebo functions are actually negative. Um, and so, so that's the kind of thing in which, um, uh, you know, I, I, I would argue that, um, uh, you know, a large part of consumerism is effectively analogous to the tea industry, the coffee industry, the tobacco industry. Uh, it provides us with, you know, um, essentially, you know, mood altering potential. And how can you create a product that affects the mood altering potential? How can you become an alchemist, as you say in your book? Um, storytelling, context shifting um uh pricing you uh, in other words if you want to become an alchemist one of the first things you simply have to do is abandon the idea that economics and narrow functionality are um uh uh are, are the sole um that in other words you have to abandon the idea that business decisions can be safely made by economists acting alone because if you don't have this placebo element to it, um, you can produce a product which in all objective terms is very, very good. And by the way, it will have a market, that product. If you have a product that's objectively, there are people in, who in certain categories kind of buy rationally, hmm. just as there are people who wear anoraks, okay? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, there. Are, by the way, total motorbike obsessives will occasionally buy a motorbike entirely on the spec. You know, there are mm -hmm. IT obsessives who, when they buy a laptop, they look only at the spec. Um, uh, they tend to live alone, but I mean, there we go. Um, but um, uh, the point, the point I'm making there is that you will have a market if you want to create high margin value you do what steve jobs did which is you add as much emotional value as you can independent of the spec hmm. and so in no particular category has apple ever been category leading in terms of the objective performance okay. attributes of the product um what what matters is the emotional feeling generated by using the product Right. And, and Jobs himself came up against, you know, um, uh, a certain degree of pushback within Apple. You know, there were engineers in Apple who would say things like, you know, I don't understand what Steve does. He can't even code. Yeah. And so uh, in the same way, uh, you know, generally the ability to create a really profitable organization is linked to your ability to make business decisions that your finance director wouldn't approve. Hmm. because yeah. your finance director tends to have a deterministic reductionist model of the world in which um, numerical attributes and characteristics are the measure of success. And those products produced by people with that mindset will never generate significant margins or indeed significantly large volumes of consumer enthusiasm. Dyson, on the other hand, and Dyson's an interesting case because I think I think he thinks the products sell because of superior engineering. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that that may be true to a degree, but the reason they command such an insane price premium is probably because of superior design. And very good UX customer service, very good websites, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, um, the thing, you know, I don't think had you made Dyson's beige and opaque that he'd be able to charge £500 for a vacuum cleaner. Hmm. So you basically have to focus on the status and the emotional side of the product. The very thing 
Now, a useful attribute to looking at this would be a thing called Carnot theory or the Carnot model uh, after a man called Carnot, who's a professor at the University of Tokyo. And he describes products as having threshold attributes, which are just basic, you know, do they do, you know, do they not fail in any particular way? And he said the relationship between customer satisfaction and threshold attributes scales sublinearly, which is that, you know, okay, you won't buy a pint of milk if you buy the brand of milk on two or three occasions and the bottle leaks. You'll find another brand. Okay. Then there are performance attributes which are how good the thing is at doing the job it's officially supposed to do, you know, the thing that people claim to care about. And that might be in the case of a cassette deck and sound reproduction, battery life, uh, build quality, uh, portability, all those, you know, all those perfect things. And those tend to scale with happiness linearly. And then he says there are these things called delight attributes. <coughs> and the classic example of that in terms of, the DVD player or the cassette deck would be the eject mechanism. Those are the things which are surprisingly oblique or orthogonal to the main function of the product, but which somehow create a disproportionate amount of joy or delight. Tesla's dog mode and the Model 3 Tesla is an example of a piece of Carnot theory. What, what is a dog mode? Ah, dog mode in the Model 3, the Tesla Model 3. It persuaded me to order a Model 3, and I don't even have a dog. So because the car's electric, you can leave the air conditioning on while you go shopping. Mm. And so you can set it to dog mode. It'll keep the car at a constant temperature, uh, perfectly habitable and safe for the dog, uh, up until the point where the battery reaches 20%, I think. So essentially they then realize there's a problem because people don't know about dog mode unless they own a tesla and if you park your dog in a car in phoenix arizona when the outside temperature is 100 degrees passers-by or petter activists will come up and smash your car's window because they assume the dog's dying and so the dog mode builds on a Tesla function called sentry mode, which detects anybody else coming up and approaching your car. And it starts filming people when they approach your car. And then as soon as anybody approaches the car to look at your dog, a big, big message in huge type will appear on the Tesla's enormous central touchscreen, which says, don't worry, picture of a dog. Don't worry, my owner will be back shortly. I'm at a comfortable 68 degrees and I'm perfectly comfortable. Wow. And that's to prevent petter activists rescuing your dog from what they assume is, you know, uh, uh, near dehydration or whatever. And, and now that attention to detail, you know, I don't have a dog, but what that does is create extraordinary levels of delight. Fart mode is slightly childish, I think, in the Tesla Model 3. But nonetheless, uh, my children uh, thought that was the best thing about the entire car. So there you go fart mode you can uh, direct the car to produce a kind of ventriloquist fart in one of the five seats that you choose by using the turn indicator and therefore you can embarrass your passengers wow and that's clearly why tesla has such tribalism behind the brand it's as much, I mean, there are lots of reasons. First of all, if you've made a brave decision, your need to practice adaptive preference formation is stronger because you're less confident about your eccentric decision and therefore your need to reassure yourself tends to make you more of an advocate and an evangelist than you would be if you'd bought a petrol car. Um, but a large part of it, I think, is the fact that um, uh, Tesla as an organization is not just very, very good at engineering. They're very good at psychological engineering. Yeah. And I want to draw a hypothetical with you, if it's OK. Of course. Imagine that you're 22 years old. You're just out of college, have a, a very low budget, but you want to start your own brand. You still you still have the same knowledge that you have now. So which industry and which marketing strategies would you use to push the brand forward? Uh, I've, got, I've got a very small budget, which means I've got to use creativity. If you've got a very large budget, you can signal uh, costly signaling by dint of simple extravagance and scale. If you've got a small budget, you need talent. And so as a result, what I'd use is I might use... Um, 
um, funnily enough, depending on, I might use media that are just underrated. So I might adopt a completely different strategy and just say, okay, it's going to be radio and direct mail. Okay. And the reason is that my, don't bear in mind, okay, my kids don't get any direct mail. When they get a letter, it's actually, it has far more cut through a physical letter to my children than almost anything else. Because, you know, you know, the people who are making the decisions all grew up in an age where people were bombarded with direct mail. I mean, you know, America in 1995, uh, in the run up to Christmas, you might get so many catalogs, you could barely open your door. Uh, that's not the case anymore. And um, uh, so I might just say, OK, when everybody else zigzags, that's one strategy if you're constrained for resources. Uh, the other one is you use creativity. In other words, you do something incredibly brave and clear. It could be brave, sexy, funny, m musical, poetic, elegant, crafted, uh, you know, but I'd use some sort of uh, I'd burn something that was uh, costly in terms of time and effort but not necessarily costly in terms of of um uh of finances as a you know as as a signaling device the example i always give of this is look if you want to invite people to a wedding you can't just send an email saying here's my wedding this is the address of the church because it doesn't make the thing seem a significant enough event and part of the point of advertising is simply to to um, magnify the significance of what you're doing. And that was put brilliantly to me by an account man called Steve Barton, who said, we want a thousand businesses to test drive Windows NT 32-bit advanced server. And this was years ago, decades ago. Okay, And we have to make it seem like a big deal or they won't be bothered to run a kind of test bench with the software on. And she said, oh, really? He said, I'd like to come up with an award-winning or fun bit of creative. Uh, you know, something mischievous, noticeable, uh, extravagant, whatever. He said, if we can't do that, write a really, really nice letter and we'll send it to them by FedEx rather than in the post. And so if you can't use creativity, you use money. Okay, very simple thing. Now, in the case of the wedding... OK, one way of doing it, if you've got access to funds or your parents are paying for the wedding and they've got money and they're very anxious about making the wedding seem like a big deal, you send out a card invitation with gilt edges, which is thermographed or even better engraved in an envelope lined with tissue paper with a handwritten address and a first class stamp. OK, OK, and that that's fine. That does the job. I don't get one of those invitations and go, what the fuck's this shit? I go, OK. It's a wedding. It's going to be quite a big one. You know, it's going to be a, you know, a goodie. Okay. Now, if I haven't got that money, I could send an email, but then people go, well, it sounds like there's going to be a bit of a cash bar. It doesn't really matter whether or not I turn up and I will feel, you know, I won't feel particularly um, privileged in being invited to this event because it's just an email. Whereas if you've done something expensive, you've obviously done it only to a small number of people. You know, even Microsoft couldn't afford to send a FedEx envelope to half a million people. Well, they could afford to, obviously, but I mean, highly unlikely they would do so. The very use of FedEx would say, I'm part of a rare and select group. And similarly, the use of card and engraving and so forth. Now, if I can't afford that, what I need is talent rather than money. And let's say I'm a talented singer songwriter and I record a song which invites people to my wedding, which includes in rhyme the address of the church and the address of the reception and the names of the people who are getting married. And it's a good song because it's a nice tune and the words are funny, clever, brave, okay, you know, interesting, eccentric, whatever. Okay. And I've paid a price to create this thing. And I email, I record that song on YouTube and I email my guests a link to that song on YouTube. That's an effective advertisement because it's costly in terms of talent, in terms of some scarce good. The scarce good doesn't have to be money. It just has to be something that's scarce. And talent is something in scarce supply. Hmm. And, and which uh, industry would you think you're going to what you would go into oh boy at the moment i'd go into the video conferencing industry i think ux in video conferencing is fascinating 
Uh, I think it, I, I, I think the whole behavioral question of whether we can use this technology to um, change the way we work forever in a significant and life enhancing way, or whether we squander this opportunity during COVID-19 um, and just go back to business as usual. I, I, I think it'd be a terrible shame if we did that because we've been handed something on a plate, not intentionally, we wouldn't have chosen it, but it's forced us all to change our behavior simultaneously. And when a behavior is simultaneous, it's more likely to stick. And how would you create alchemy in the video conferencing industry? Um, well, I don't want you to give too much away. I think uh, Zoom has already done a bit of that because an extraordinary thing has happened, which is Zoom is not free, uh, or at least it is free for 40 minutes, but it's not free for heavier users. Um, it is up against competition in terms of face-to-face -face communication from Microsoft, Google, Facebook, um, pretty much, pretty much every. I mean, you know, Skype, obviously part of Microsoft. Uh, there's Teams, part of Microsoft. Um, now, uh, th those are the giants of the tech world. Apple, obviously, as well. Now, the strange thing is that Zoom has managed to win. And part of the reasons it wins is because technologically it has some advantages. It was built for the cloud. So uh, secondly, psychologically, it, it, they realized some very clever things like people can cope with video degradation to a degree, but they can't cope with audio degradation. Now, what tended to happen is that techie people focused on the video because that was the difficult problem. And actually, audio was the important thing to solve. Because we're having a chat now. This is kind of broadcast quality podcast. We're doing it over whereby, as it happens, not Zoom. Um, but nonetheless, I can chat to you here with a pair of headphones on. You also have a pair of, for the benefit of listeners, um, Antonio also has a pair of over-the-air headphones. And we can chat to each other in the way that Listening to this is akin to listening to Radio 4. Me listening to him is 90% as good as a chap uh, in the pub who's sitting, obviously, six feet away from me. Um, now, by contrast, if we'd made that same a call over a telephone, which strips out most of the timbre from the human voice, it would be perhaps half as satisfying and half as natural and half as easygoing. So they got that right. But they also got a big thing, right, which is how do you join your meeting? You join it through a URL and you join it in the browser. And they took a single, this is brilliant behavioral science, you take a behavior that someone's familiar with, click on a URL, and you build something new onto an existing familiar behavior. Rather like the idea that, you know, if you can get someone to do something while they're cleaning their teeth, the likelihood that they'll develop the habit is much higher because they're already familiar with cleaning their teeth. And it's something they do naturally. Yeah. And where do you think the future of marketing is going now? I don't know because uh, we're at a, a little bit of a crux point. I think it needs to reinvent itself quite a bit. Um, I think it's too siloed that the number of people who are even allowed to solve complex systems problems is too small. I, I think we need we need a new take on uh, what we do here. Well, no, th thank you so much, Rory. It's been a really insightful It's a huge pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. But as I said, let's not waste this. Okay, you know, in the it, you know, it's an opportunity for advertising people to work more creatively by mixing time in solitude with time in groups. Um, I think the advertising industry is sometimes too sociable. I think one of the reasons that successful creative people often act like bastards is that if you create a certain reluctance among people to come and see you, it buys you a lot of uninterrupted time. And I'd end up by watching a reading, a paper by Paul Graham, who's one of my heroes. Uh, it's called simply uh, Make a Schedule versus Manager Schedule. And it's one of the best very short reads on the optimal use of your time that I've ever come across. So a long time equals higher creativity. Yeah, long periods of uninterrupted time. When I wrote my book, if I took a day off work, I wrote 500, 1,000 words. If I took two days off work, I wrote 4,000 words. If I took five days off work, it started to increase you know, almost exponentially. Wow, that's perfect, Rory. And is there anything else you'd like to say or promote? Uh, if you're working from home or you're studying from home as a student, 
um, and you have the means to do so, buy a large monitor. If you uh, if you haven't got the means to buy a 30-inch 4K monitor or similar, uh, club together with the rest of the people in your house and buy, buy a 4K TV, which will do the job of being a huge monitor during the day fairly well. Don't try and do this. I've told my whole team this. Don't try and do this using only a laptop. Um, uh, because uh, you'll start to go insane. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Rory. It's, it's a, a huge pleasure. It's been a joy. 